Good Monday morning. Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect. I am DDP, and today we are talking Mavericks Clippers 3. Will Dallas finally be able to get over the hump? We're going to talk about that today because now our playoff pictures are locked in. I mean, I guess you could look at it and say because the play-in tournament has to happen, we don't know what the 7-8 really is going to be, so that matchup's in the air. But ostensibly, as it relates to Dallas's schedule, we know what it is. We've known for a while this is what it was going to be. But, uh, yeah, we kind of we kind of backed off the last couple post-game shows because – after the Miami game, it was evident Dallas was going to be dialing it back, getting rest for Luka, rest for Kyrie. And uh, I think that's brilliant because they didn't have anything more to play for, no matter what it was going to be the Clippers. And it was more important to get Luka and Kyrie and some of those other key players their rest at that point. So, yeah, you you lose comfortably to the 13-win Pistons. That That one did surprise me a little bit, mostly the score, but whatever. And then uh, you go to Oklahoma City, and just like I talked about after that Miami game, I did touch on that matchup, and I said, look, OKC might still be fighting for that number one overall seed in that game. Dallas is not going to play Luka and Kyrie. OKC, not only are they a very young, deep, balanced team, they're going to have something to still play for. And it felt like that because, good gracious, I thought for a while Dallas was going to lose that game by 50-plus points. And it wasn't that far off that mark, but even still, does not matter. Now we are locked in for the 4-5 matchup. It's the Clippers again. Of course it's the Clippers again. I talked about this as well. If Dallas is going to finally get over that hump, if they're going to finally, I know they had their deep playoff run a couple of years ago, and that had nothing to do with the Clippers, but if we want to talk about changing the narrative, changing this conversation, even though it shouldn't apply to Luca because Luca's stats in matchups with the Clippers in playoffs, especially is mind boggling. Like his, his stats and performances have nothing to do with why Dallas has not won either of those first two matchups has had a lot more to do with the health of his team and the general uh, combination of players around him his supporting cast. Now we have an interesting matchup though, because now both these teams do look considerably different, but my general feeling is that the Clippers aren't, they, they might be better than they were back then in the, in the 2021 matchup. I don't think they're light years better than they were. However, I, I think if they're better, it's a small step, maybe two forward but i still look at it and think like okay you have russ and harden now on this team both past their primes both still can be effective and have shown that in stretches russ in, in particular coming off the bench at times um and that's a really a role he found for himself with the clippers ha has had a good impact for them but i still have reservations about that and i do still feel like it comes down in large part to the health of Kawhi leonard so as we're trying to get a grasp of this and we say, okay, they look like they might be better than they were then. Where does Dallas rank? However, just trying to keep in perspective this, this matchup previously, the rosters Dallas had to go to war with, like not even close to what they're featuring now. First of all, this is uh, from Nick Angstad on Twitter. He talks about the previous, or the players returning from those previous matchups in the 2020 and 2021 playoff series. For Dallas, you return Luca, Tim Hardaway, Maxi, Dwight Powell, and Josh Green. For the Clippers, you return Kawhi, Paul George, um, Zubats, Man, and Coffee. Both teams, he says, for both teams, 44% of minutes played in those series were by players still on the roster. So less than half of those minutes are returning here. Interesting how that kind of differs here. But Dallas in this matchup does have an interesting opportunity because, yeah, it's not just the, the on-paper thing like, oh, well, now you've got a superstar in Kyrie Irving. It's also like more specifically looking than that, how the Mavericks have performed in the clutch. 
The Mavericks are the third best team in the clutch overall for the season in terms of their net rating. They were 23 and nine in the last five minutes of games within five points. That's clutch. Uh, also looking at this, they have the third best offense and eighth best defense over the last 35 games. So top 10 in both those ratings, which we always talk about. Like if you want to actually be taken seriously and really a true contender, you got to be top 10 in both those really idealistically top five in both of those. So defense still a little out there, but again, they had that stretch of a week and a half where it got real bad again. So maybe they're around that conversation and it, it's just, it's a very different look when you think about that. Even you think about the supporting cast, the fact is the Mavericks had no front court in either of those first two matchups. Yeah. They had Porzingis, but Porzingis in 2020 played a half. Like in that first go around, he basically played a quarter and a half before getting ejected in his first ever playoff game. And then he had to be shut down because of the knee. The next go around, he was a shell of himself just standing in the corner for a seven game series and just being a catch and shoot guy. That's basically where Porzingis was at that point. So like you might look at it on paper and say like, oh, well, Porzingis, right? You must not have been watching because that's not the Porzingis that you're getting today with Boston. So it's a very different picture of that. And Jalen Brunson was not Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson was borderline unplayable in that series in particular. Um, and, you know, obviously that was the last Carlisle year. So it's it's a very different picture of where these teams were. Now you also add in guys like Derek Lively, Daniel Gafford, P.J. Washington. Um, again, Dante Exum, like... I know some people, uh, more casual fans, are just like, oh, James Harden's going to feast on Dante Exum. They met up in the playoffs once, and Exum actually gave Harden fits. Now, I'm not going to say necessarily that, like, book it, that's what's going to happen again, but it's worth saying that was Harden kind of at the peak of his powers when he was the guy for the Rockets. Compare that to now, and it's like, hmm, I don't know. It's interesting. And, you know, that was Exum when he was on the, the jazz. I almost said magic for some reason on the jazz. So it's been a minute, but even still, we have seen this matchup in the playoffs before, and it didn't necessarily go great for the Clippers. Dallas's overall defensive identity is so night and day different than what it was in either of those two series. Their depth. Keep in mind, we, we played a game seven in which we had to start Boban Mariarvich. Mariarvich. Why did I just but butcher the hell out of that name? It's early, and I'm realizing now I probably need more coffee. We had to play Boban starting at center for game seven in that series. In fact, we made that switch in game five, and we got away with it in game five. Game six, we tried our luck again, and we did not get away with it. And I said, okay, there's no way they try to roll the dice on that again. They've got to have learned their lesson after that they did not because he also started game seven it it did not it did not compute uh for this team so when i try to make sense here let me pull up some of the comments here um for you guys just so i can make sure all you lovely people are in here with me in these comments uh let me see let me see let me see there we go chat overlay first in the house Oh, I got to hide the Luca Kawhi thing. Otherwise, it's going to cover you out. Super chat. Must of fame. What's good, man? Appreciate you. Uh, dang, I got to hide my logo, too. There we go. Mavs in five. Wow, I like that prediction right off the right off the top rope with that, with the bold prediction. I dig it. Uh, Frank, what's good? Luca has to be super aggressive early to soften up the Clippers defense so others can get good looks, better looks, he says, to shoot or attack closeouts. Hardaway cannot, and I stress, cannot play. He's 10th in the rotation at best. Green is ninth, even though they can't navigate on ball screens to save his life. He's good connective tissue piece. Generally, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there with you on that. I think green is a little bit of a concern because of that screen running thing, but what he brings in terms of the uh, just the X factor, the hustle, the heart, and all of that, the effort plays, I do think can can give you a, a shot in the arm every now and then. And Hardaway, if you're going to play him, yeah, it's got to be limited minutes and it's got to be very strategic. Or if he's showing you signs he's on a burner, then you just roll the dice and let the man go. But even still, um, 
since the trade deadline, here's some of the stats I want to point out here, and I'll circle back to I lost the thread of what I was talking about right before I brought in the comment, so I'll circle back to that in a minute uh, if, I, if it returns to mine. But uh, since the trade deadline, this comes from Landon Thomas uh, on Twitter. He says, the Mavericks are fourth in rebounding, eighth in points in the paint, and fifth fewest when it comes to points um, points allowed in the paint. So the defense, particularly the front court defense, has been a revolution for the Mavericks here uh, since they made the trade for Gafford and we've really solidified the interior. That that was the biggest thing for Dallas because when teams were scoring a bajillion points against us, it was largely because they could get 70 plus percent scoring in the paint, it felt like. It did not matter what Dallas was trying to do to slow them down, to stop them, whatever. And it just became like, all right, can you outscore them? Well, if you can't get a stop to save your life, probably not because you also didn't have rebounding to like end a possession for the other team. So even if they were missing a shot, whether it was an open three, whether it was a bucket at the rim, they were more often than not getting the ball back. Now that's not happening because now you have much better rebounding. Obviously, Luke has always been a great rebounder, but now with Gafford, with Lively, PJ Washington does a great job on the boards. Like you got all these guys, Exum uh, has been very solid on the boards as well at times. Um, all these guys that can just make a huge difference ending possessions and allowing you to run the other way. Plus, you can actually push pace now. You couldn't push pace at all in those first two matchups. You had no, no thoroughbreds. You had no guys that could just go. Now you do. Now you have athletes who can streak down the floor and get a bucket for you. Luca's throwing full court passes, it feels like, every couple games where he's barely having to get to the free throw line before just flipping a pin-perfect, picture-perfect pass on, the, on a dime 94 feet the other direction for a layup or a dunk or whatever. Just incredible stuff. And it's like, yeah, if you can find even just a couple baskets like that every now and then, it's going to help you because that's debilitating. Whether whether it's the other team making a bucket or Luca just grabbing it off the rim, flipping it up the other way, and two seconds later, you've already scored another basket. That's how you snatch snatch momentum in the game. Like you just don't give the other team a second to even process. Okay, back on defense. Shit, they're already scored. Like it, it's already already a bucket the other way. You just keep them on their heels. That's the big thing. So that was the Mavericks before the trade or since the trade deadline. Fourth in rebounds, eighth in points in the paint scored, fifth fewest in points in the paint allowed. The Clippers, meanwhile, in that same stretch, 22nd in rebounding, 17th in points in the paint, and tied for 19th uh, lowest points allowed in the paint. So basically what that is to say, they are towards the bottom half. They are inside the bottom half of the league when it comes to points allowed in the paint. So... Yeah, it's uh, it's better for you in that respect. They're trending in a in a different direction for you here. Here's uh, some of that context I think I was looking for earlier when I was trying to talk about the difference in the the lineups here. 2020 versus the Clippers, um, game one, two thirty left in the first quarter. This is from any Induka Mavericks, uh, well, prospect contributor here. He says, looking at some old playoff lineups, the Mavericks were going to war with in the Luka era. He says, 2020 versus the Clippers, uh, game one, 2.30 left in the first quarter. You had Luka, Seth Curry, Trey Burke, Michael Kidd, Gilchrist, and Boban. Yeah. Um, interesting. Other guys you had in those same lineups, DeLon Wright. Um, very, very different looking Mavericks than what we've got today. So worth pointing out, do I, Victor asks, do I worry everyone likes us now? We went from under the radar to, in some cases, third contender. Um, I don't worry about it in the same way. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, I do believe this team has good leadership. As much as it surprised me at the time to, to acknowledge uh, Markeith Morris being a good leader on this team, there's there's something to be said about the fact that Kyrie, Luca, and others credited him when they were on their really bad skid of losing like, what was it, six out of eight games or something after the All-Star break when things really got shaky and we were doing the whole fire Jason Kidd thing. By the way, I still don't love the idea of signing him to a new deal, but it's going to happen at this point. I don't see any way it doesn't. 
but that's a whole different category, a whole different conversation. When all that was going down, it was Markeef who was credited for bringing the team together, assuring everybody, hey, man, we're going to be all right. Don't worry about it. We're going to be all right. We just got to weather this storm right now. And then they've got that gutty, gutty win against the Heat in Dallas. And I talked after that game about how I felt like that could be a, a turning point for them. Like they've been struggling. They've been fighting for their lives. And then they dug that game out through just grit and determination. And that felt significant. And I think and I think it really proved that as well because they went on another little run there where they won like five, six games, whatever. Yeah, the streak didn't go as long as when they were, I think, how high did their previous win streak get up to? Did they get up to 11? It, it, it was crawling for sure. They were definitely rolling with some momentum before they hit a skid. But they went on another nice little win streak. And overall, they hadn't really looked back since then. Like their record since that moment is impeccable. So that's that's a credit to Markeith, even though he's a guy that does not hardly ever, ever play. Uh, Kyrie, having, again, a guy like that, that kind of leader, and Luca has credited him a lot as well with just the leadership and the way he carries himself, how he has changed kind of the attitude of the team, not just talking about this previous offseason coming into this year with everything to prove, but also just how he's kind of carried himself through the year. Yeah, one stop, one stop. Yeah, exactly. The on the court vocal leadership. And I think that's kind of one of those things too. That's a good, not just a good influence for Luca, but just another kind of thing. Like Dirk, Dirk in his best days, um, that title year was really the year Dirk kind of became the better vocal leader. Cause we saw like during the 2006 run, we saw him getting more vocal. And honestly, we saw him uh, chewing out Eric Dampier more than a few times. He was vocal, but it, it was a very like hard nosed vocal thing. And it didn't seem like his teammates necessarily responded the best to it. And it's kind of like a guy's demeanor and his energy. Some guys are better suited to lead by example. Other guys are better to lead as like that emotional core. And for Dirk, it didn't necessarily feel natural for him leading in that way. Now he got better at it. And by the time 2011 came around, he, even in 2011, it was still a lot of like, follow my lead and I'm going to pick and choose when I talk instead of just constantly trying to talk to you. I think Luca talks a lot, but I don't know if it has the same resonance and energy as like when Kyrie is talking to the team. So that's a great thing Kyrie has helped bring to the table. And I think Luca is effective. It's just not having to be that one voice, having another guy of that equal caliber, essentially able to do that and bring sort of a little bit of a different energy. I think it's been a very positive thing. So it's, it's a very different picture as, as we consider like this team now versus 21 or 20, what that matchup looks like. Uh, let me run through some stats here. So with the Mavericks winning 50 games at this point, we'll see what the MVP ranking voting looks like. I was just going to throw this out here real quick. Cause these were a couple screenshots that uh, I'd saved from the other day. I was kind of just waiting for my next show to get into. So Luca on the season goes 34, nine and 10. He's first in point scored second in assist Had a 73 point game. It long time ago, but 73 point game uh, earlier this season, which was the fourth highest ever. He had the first 33, nine and nine season in NBA history. The most 30 point triple doubles since MVP season for Russell Westbrook fitting given that's uh, one of the opponents in this game or this series uh, first in 25 point games, first in 35 point games, first in 40 point games, first in 45 point games, second in three pointers made top 10 in steals 61.7% true shooting percentage highest scoring season in Mavericks history, most points per game plus rebounds per game plus assists per game since the merger. Most consecutive 25 point triple doubles ever. Most consecutive 30 point triple doubles ever. Lifted the Mavericks from the 11 seed to the five seed. Most games missed by teammates among all playoff teams. And as I said earlier, gave the Mavericks a 50 win season. And the Mavericks are number one in clutch win percentage. Oh, and they have the sixth best record in the NBA. If the Mavericks, by the way, were in the Eastern Conference, they would be the two seed right now. The Knicks ended up with the same record and they're the two seed. It's just the difference between the West and the East right now. So all of that to put into context of uh, anyone saying 
Jokic or SGA, I get that the Thunder are the youngest team to ever clinch the number one seed um, in the playoff brackets. I get that. That's an incredible stat, and SGA has been phenomenal this year. But to me, it's like if you're not going to put Luka number one, the notion that there's another guy ahead of him between him and Jokic, I, I just don't see. Because like while that's an awesome achievement for uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander, it's not – it's not a tenth of what it feels like Luca has done in the resume I just read off. So, and the Thunder have been the healthiest playoff team all season, like in terms of total games missed by starters or guys who played 20 plus minutes. I might actually have a stat on that somewhere in here. I'll keep an eye out for it, but let me keep looking through here. Uh, Kyrie is the leader that we needed, brings a calm to Luca Storm. I, I agree with that. Do I think that kid will stick with Gafford and Lively instead of going small ball so quick? So that's an interesting kind of conversation about this matchup, and I've seen people weighing in on it. Um, again, I mentioned him earlier, but Nick Angstad had really good context for that. Oh, wait, here. Let me see here. Yeah, Nick Angstad had really good context for that earlier. Um, let me find that here. Yeah, he says, uh, Mavericks going big is great, but that small ball unit kicks ass. And he, the lineup he's talking about is Gafford at center. Mavericks are a net rating of plus 6.3. Their offensive rating is a 116.2. Their defensive rating is a 109.9. With Lively at center, so still a big lineup, their offensive rating is a 122.3. Their defensive rating is a 116.8. With Maxi or PJ a small ball lineup. The net rating is a plus 19.5. The offense is a 118.4. The defense is a 98.9. I get what he's talking about by just giving examples of small ball lineups. I'm with TGK on this. Uh, do not make Maxi your five and give us four guards. That never looks good when we see it. I think that would be a really rough pairing here. So small ball has been good to the Mavericks. I think that the balance of this team and what makes them so dangerous and why people are starting to look at them in that respect and think that they could actually be a real contender is because they can go with whatever style they can play big and beat the hell out of you on the boards. They can beat you up inside, make life miserable for you in the paint. They also can play small and run pace and really, really challenge you for it. He says, PJ at the five, Maxi at the four. Uh, I'll be curious to see what we get from Maxi because in the two previous series, in the two previous series against the Clippers, Maxi was the best defender we could throw at Kawhi. Now the problem is Maxi has lost a step. You still see flashes where it's significant. A big part of the Mavericks getting that last that fiftieth win uh, in Miami, the last win of the season, was blown open with Maxi on the floor when they went. Uh, small there like in that second quarter when they blew it open and it went to a, like a 22 point lead at the half it was largely like when the doors blew off was with maxi out there so maxi had a good game there you still get those flashes he's never going to be a guy that gives you a ton of points or a ton of whatever and i think with how he's kind of dropped off a bit the three point percentage that was there for those couple of years we we had a stretch of a few years there where he was shooting always right around 40%. And we're like, hey, 3 and D, okay, versatile defender at that, cool. That first matchup against the Clippers, he was miserable because he was running himself ragged just trying to make life difficult for Kawhi. And it wasn't a whole lot better the next go-around because he still had the same problem, except then I think he was also dealing with some back issues. So I look at it and say, like, I'll be curious to see how he's able to do here because not as much is going to be asked of him. But I'm also aware that um maybe maybe running him a little bit with that small ball lineup where yeah if he's the four it's a little bit of a small ball lineup not a true small ball at that point but would be interesting to see uh again more stats here the combination of luca and Kyrie with lineups of pj washington again nick angstad always great stats and analytics here with pj washington the luca Kyrie pairing has 1178 possessions a plus 12.8 net rating an offensive rating of 119.8 a defensive rating of 107 significant 
with Derek Jones Jr. 1337 possessions and off uh, a ready, excuse me, net rating of 11.2, offensive rating of 119.5, defensive rating of 108.3. And with Exum, let's see. Looks like a 12 point, excuse me, 23.9 percent net rating, 132.6 offensive rating, 108.6 defensive rating. Goodness, uh, I knew Exum being kind of that three three guard lineup. We let you know during that playoff run, that three guard lineup Dallas loved to run was Brunson, uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, and Luca, and it really did give teams fits. Having Exum. Not entirely different from that. And the fact is, he can give you a lot better defense and clutch shooting than Dinwiddie could. So, very interesting here. It's also funny to me. I really had, didn't take a whole lot of victory lap to dunk on Spencer Dinwiddie, even though after he picked the Lakers over coming back to Dallas, he for some reason felt a need to take multiple shots at the Mavericks and imply that, like, ah, they're just kind of like little bro. But, like, the Lakers are like dad, essentially. Like, you mess up. Oh, did my graphic say? Mavericks Clippers four. That's funny. It's not even the correct Roman numeral. Get it together, DDP. Wait, no, I'm just blind as a bat. It is three. Scratch that. Carry on. Nothing to see here. Um, and now I've lost my train of thoughts. <laughs> Squirrel. Um, but oh yeah, Dinwiddie. Him saying that with the Lakers, it's like, oh, you better, you know, you better fly right, or else we're gonna wear you out. Essentially, like. Dad, dad gets on you, gets your attention. The Mavericks are just kind of like little bro, like whatever. Well, the the Lakers are in the play in picture here and in a ru much rougher position than where Dallas is. So it's like, yeah, I'm gonna say you missed on that one, bro. You you didn't you didn't have it right. <laughs> he wants to be in the play in, yeah, I guess. Doris Brooke was swooning over Maxi's defense. He's not having to overhelp. Yeah, I just I feel like Maxi's lost a step and there's been there's been some challenges there. There's been moments that have been like, oof, you're kind of cooked a little bit, aren't you? But then he'll have some moments where they're good. And so it's like, OK, maybe in a limited role, more supplemental. Again, we're not going to have to rely on him and use him as heavily as we had to in those two previous matchups with the Clippers. So, you know, maybe, 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 maybe. Uh, by the way, also, Nick had uh the stats as well that same thing so we talked about pj we talked about derrick jones jr we talked about exum he also had tim hardaway jr with the luca Kyrie matchup that's just under 800 possessions 799 a net rating of plus 83 offensive rating of 125 three defensive rating of 117 so make of that what you will um i i talked before about the the big lineups and all of that we know that Luca is the first Maverick ever to lead the league in points per game. And also the fact that he did it in most points total. It's pretty nifty. Well, Daniel Gafford also did something similar with that. He's the first Maverick to ever lead the league in field goal percentage. He shot 72.5% from the field, which is the third highest field goal percentage of all time. So kind of cool that the, the two of them were able to do that um, in the same season, even though again, Gafford hadn't been here nearly as long. Um, uh, let's see anything else I wanted to call out here. Uh, yeah, they're just talking about the previous matchup there in the comments. So I, and all for that, um, <laughs> as it relates to the MVP conversation, the whole discourse around the whole thing is broken because like whether it's like guys just trying to stand for their teams or whatever and they're their guy or what whatever it's like i get that the thunder and nuggets are one and two and so people are going to look at that and say like well they both have definitively two of the top three guys in the conversation and then putting the context of what the thunder just did that means shay should have even greater boost that that's their reasoning of it and it's like but that feels like the lazy thing because to me is the MVP. This is always a philosophical question. Is the MVP, the best player on the best team or one of the best teams, or is the MVP, the guy who, if he's not on his team, his team is drastically worse. Like you might have that in the year where 
a superstar player gets injured and he's gone for the season and his team that's normally like a, a contender suddenly doesn't make the playoffs or whatever. And they're like, Oh, I mean, you could kind of argue it was really this guy that was the MVP because we had a team that's always in the conversation, not even in the playoffs because he was out. It's like, I get what you're saying, but like, to me, if you take Luke off the Mavericks, even with as great as Kyrie has been this year, especially when you consider how many games he missed, um, it's just, it's not a playoff team without him. It's not like the West was a log jam of records after you got past the first couple seeds. And so it's like, you look at that and you say, okay, take Luca off of that. And when you consider the, the heavy lifting he had to do early in the year, again, the Mavericks through December, January alone, the number of games missed by Maverick players that average 20 minutes per game, staggering, staggering the difference in that. So when you have discourse from some of these people who were like, ah, oh, well, the reason it's SGA is like, yeah, I don't disagree that Luca has been on this, this awesome tear to close the season, but really, really the season started, you know, in October, not February. And it's like, okay, man, like if you're going to say something, at least take a moment to glance at the stats, at least look and see like, was this guy already doing something? Or did these stats come on late? Because these stats, I assure you, did not come on late. And I know everybody's dunked on this on Twitter, but I understand Mavs, YouTube, Mavs, Twitter, not necess necessarily one and the same. And so I wanted to run it back here and uh, still bring this conversation to the forefront if it hadn't already been, which I'm sure some of these other great creators, shout out TGK, what's good? Um, I've probably already brought this to the, to the table here, but I'll read you the tweet and then uh, the obvious response here. So... This is, the guy says, season started in October, not February. Luke has been on a completely magnificent, has been completely magnificent uh, in the second half of the season, but SGA still leads in non-trivial margin in season long impact stats, which I think reflects the reality of the season and is equally reflected in the standings gap. Oh, interesting conversation. Except again, as we said earlier, the Thunder have been like the healthiest playoff team. Like they've had very, very few injuries. Whereas the Mavericks have been devastated by injuries, particularly that December, January conversation. So Luca's slow start by this guy's metric would mean that his 30, 34.7 points, 9.6 assists and 8.6 rebounds in the first 40 games of the season between October 1st and January 31st might just be like the best slow start uh, in NBA history. Like you look at it that way. It's like, even if the stats are better now than they were then, the the usage and how much heavy lifting he had to do just to get that to that point not even remotely the same like it, it's he had to do more then than he had to do in the back half of the season the difference is his team was finally healthy and were able to help distribute the balance of that and able to actually close out more games and just win if you had the same measure of health all season this Mavericks team Say, and no, 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 let me let me revise that because that's too that's too pie in the sky discussion here. Forget saying this exact version of the Mavericks. Still the trade deadline, bring it in Gafford, bring it in Washington when you did. Fine. This Mavericks team with the same level of health as the Thunder all season, meaning guys who played at least 20 minutes per game, healthy for as many games for the Mavericks as those same what guys were for the Thunder. Mavericks have the better record. It's it's not even like a conversation to me because the spread between where the Thunder are and where the Mavericks are is not that great. The difference is the health games where they were missing significant pieces and Luka could go for insane stat lines, but he just wasn't getting enough help or the defensive presence, especially in the first half of the season where it's like, oh, damn, Lively's up. We'll chalk this up to an L because we have zero paint protection here no ability to get these boards other than luca and it just you were too thin in those areas to get a lot of those wins early on so that's why you were struggling while you were floundering towards the back end of that playoff picture and having to kind of fight and scratch and claw to climb up from 11 to 10 to 9 to 8 and then you get all the way to five like it's because the health finally was there and even though luca continued to be great at a similar level he didn't have to do as much heavy lifting. He didn't have to run himself ragged every single game. And again, Kyrie being healthy for an extended stretch, I'm knocking on wood every time I reference this, but uh, being healthy for an extended stretch and 
in a rhythm was able to help that that burden as well. How many other teams have like a superstar teammate and like get criticized for it or docked points for it? When LeBron was winning MVPs, was he docked for the fact that, you know, yes, you can talk about like the first Cleveland team because, yeah, he really didn't have much help there. But uh, in Miami, winning MVPs, was he docked for having Bosch and Wade? Wade was the better player of the two their first year together in Miami. So why wasn't that? Why wasn't that docked? Why wasn't that held again? Uh, I mean, that was the Derrick Rose MVP. So maybe that's not the best example. But even still, the fact that with those superstar teammates, he was never docked for it. It was never held against him. And SGA, the Thunder don't have another superstar, but they're so loaded with guys that are like in that kind of conversation for like, hey, if nothing else, these are really nice role players. And you have a couple guys that are like, that's a bona fide number two. That guy might has the potential to be a number two option. And then you got a couple guys that are like, hey, they could be interchangeable at your number three. I The Thunder is a very talented team. Uh, I think for them, the conversation is going to be their youth and experience. Because they were in that play-in tournament last year, didn't get through it, but they were still, they're still the second youngest team in the NBA right now. Youngest team to ever clinch the number one overall seed. But the weight being put to that accomplishment in SGA's favor feels very lopsided compared to everything else with Luka, where we can run like, we could run an in, uh, an end of credits role. Like you go to the movie theater, you watch the movie, those end credits that run for 10 minutes of just all those names where it's like, you just can't read all of it, can't process all of it. That's Luca's resume, it feels like, when you look at the stats and the context of everything he's done. And SGA feels like it fits on a on a single screen where it's like all there, all fitting there. You don't even have to scroll the thing. And it's like, the stuff that's there is very nice, but it's not as lengthy of a resume, but the weight that's being artificially kind of attributed to it feels disjointed to me and i think it's just because a lot of these people are one moving the goalpost on luca and two they're putting all of their stock in like oh well he's a top three candidate for the mvp and he's got he just clinched the best record in the western conference so clearly he's got to be at least in the top two of that conversation it's like not really because of those three mvp candidates there's only one guy you take off the team and they don't make the playoffs even if you took Jokic off of the nuggets i still think the nuggets are at least in the play-in they're a really good team really good team um the thunder mm, if you take sga off that team they might not be a playoff team that that might be fair but again if anything i still look at that and i still say like what's the length of the resume and how much weight are we artificially putting on the seating in this and not the overall picture of health who had to do more and then on top of that, who did do more? Leonardo, what's good? The team that wins out the series is viewed as the one to defeat Denver, he says. So whoever wins this series with the Mavericks Clippers, that's probably who wins. Um, oh, damn. I just realized I didn't even change my effing video title. That's hilarious. Hilarious in the get it together DDP kind of way. Uh, let me update that. Mavs Clippers. That's Clippers three. There we go. Updated. Wait, did that end my stream? No? Cool. I thought that ended my stream for a second. I was like, get it together, DDP. All right, back to the question. Um, whoever wins this series, are they viewed as the favorite to knock out Denver? That's an interesting conversation, um, because that would be the then next ma round matchup. Uh, I think that's, I think that's fair. It, I mean, like, would I favor either of these teams against Denver? No, I, I would take Denver in a, in a seven game series again, home court advantage. Um, I would take Denver over either of these teams, but I would say both of these teams have a good shot like and a good shot doesn't have to mean that like they're favored. It just means like they have a realistic shot where maybe it's the role players like one or two guys stepping up playing over their heads a little bit because that's and we talked about this. That's oftentimes one of those things that differentiates in the playoffs is like your superstars are generally going to be your superstars unless they're James Harden, in which case they usually don't show up. I hope that comment doesn't come back to bite me. Usually that's how that's going to go. 
uh, these series are oftentimes determined by either coaching adjustments, again, concerning, or by which team's role players are able to step up. Because those road, those role players usually hold their own at home. That's usually where they play their normal level, maybe even a tick above their level. But when you shift that conversation to how are they going to play on the road, the role players who can actually play as good, if not better, raising their game even on the road is going to be the team that's in the driver's seat. Because it's it's like we know, teams know, like even if they can't stop a particular guy or option or whatever, they at least have an idea of what they need to do to contain or keep it relatively in check. It's those things when you run out of counter moves and it's like, okay, we're going to force these other guys to beat us. And then if those other guys actually step up and start beating you, that's when you're like, Ooh, okay. Uh, can we adjust here? And if it's one guy, maybe you can adjust. But if you start getting in that conversation where Lucas cooking, Kyrie's cooking, uh, you're getting Gafford with a solid performance and the interior defense is good. And then all of a sudden you're getting a hard away cooking performance where he's just going off for something. Once you get into that kind of territory and you're dealing with the Mavericks, you're like, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know how to handle that. I don't, I don't know what we can do to counteract that. We kind of just have to like keep attacking and hope that it wears out. Like if they're on, if they're on a hot streak right now, hope that it cools and we can kind of hang around in that again, that that's subjective, but that's my general impression is like, it's the role players who can play not just at or above their normal level at home where they usually play at that level, but can also transfer that to the road. If you can get that performance, that's usually where you turn a corner there and uh, become just a total nightmare scenario. So uh, let me dive in here. I saw a few questions come across on my screen here. Let's see. I saw TGK's thing. I'm just trying to make sure I didn't uh, skip over another question before that. Master Flame says, all the Clipper pods say that Hardaway is the X factor. I can't see Hardaway averaging more than eight minutes a game. I bet you he gets more than eight minutes a game, but... uh calling him the X factor. The only way he's the X factor is if he's on a burner, if he's going off, if, I mean, to be fair, he had some really good moments in the 2021 series. He did. He had some really nice moments in that game. Um, in that first, cause he didn't, I'm trying to remember, was he in the 2020 series? God, that all feels like such a, a long time ago. But I remember there was actually a moment I was trying to convince myself in 2021 that like, hey, man, he's been he's been cooking. But then game seven happened and any any Maverick not named Luca was basically like one of 14 from three or something like that. And uh, that included Artaway, obviously. And it was like, ooh, OK, maybe not, maybe not. Uh... Why is the Mavs media trying to tell everyone Maxie's a scrub uh, is good? He isn't, asks Richard Case. Why is everyone in Mavs media trying to tell us that Maxie is good? You're saying he's not. Okay. Um, I think they just still have respect for Maxie and like know that that ability is still there, even if it's not as consistent. Again, he was good in that Miami game, that 50th win. That helped us basically lock up the five seed. He was good in that performance. It's just, you're never going to see big point, big rebound totals out of Maxi. It's a very fundamentally sound game, but he will give you some shot blocking here and there. He can be a versatile defender. He is not as quick laterally as he used to be, or excuse me, horizontally as he used to be. Um, change of direction is not as good as it used to be. You're not going to be able to throw him at Kawhi like you did in those two previous series and just be like, all right, well, he'll hold his own as good as anyone we got on this roster. If you're saying that this time around, things have gone horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. Um, so I think they just understand that like in doses, in the right situations, in a in a particular chess match rotational adjustment, perhaps he can still give you something. And so I think it just comes down to like familiarity and respect for uh, how long he's been there and what he's done. All right, TGK. 
What is one stat you think will be the differentiating factor for this uh, series, not season? Uh, like which stat besides points, obviously, do I think the Mavericks need to win to steal the series? It's the four or five matchup, so I almost don't even think about it as stealing. Oh, you said steal. I thought you said steal. I was like, these two teams are matched up evenly enough. I wouldn't even think of it as stealing. Stealing is like the underdog really coming out um, to do it. Like if this was even the three, six matchup, I would think more of stealing, but still, uh, yeah. Rebounds probably that's been the Mavericks greatest strength. It feels like ever since the, ever since the um, trade deadline. And once you had that balance with Gafford, with lively, when he's been available um, and even like Exum coming back and giving you solid minutes, re rebounds and all that PJ Washington, even when Washington has been putrid shooting the ball at times, uh, he's still defending very well, giving a lot of effort, uh, rebounding well. Those kind of things matter. And so, so often during this post-deadline run here, you've had the Mavericks actually rebounding well, defending well, and like winning the rebounding battles in some cases by like 15, 20, 25, like really hammering them on the boards. You rebound well, you limit their opportunities and then you create your own on the other end, getting like offensive boards and things like that. You have an ability, like it doesn't matter. Even if the other team is shooting a better percentage than you, sometimes even a comfortably better percentage. But if you're limiting them to one, like one shot attempt in a possession, then you're really in a situation where you're able to dictate things. You break a team's will by just continuing to get second, third, fourth opportunities on the glass. If they come down, Let's say they had the first 10 possessions of the game. Now, grant first 10 possessions of the game. It's so early. These guys are way too mentally tough to be just like, oh, no, like uh, it's, it's done. We, we can't do anything about this. We're just, it's just not our day. No, 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 no. But I'm just giving a hypothetical here. If in the first 10 possessions of the game, you get three, four offensive rebounds and those lead to second chance points, whether it's layups, dunks or a kick out, reset the possession, you get a three or something. You will you will knock a team back on their heels. You will make them kind of look at that because if you're getting second, third opportunities and you're converting those into points and then on the other side, they're one and done, that's going to knock them back. It, it's kind of not, not to lean into like a football analogy here, but it's kind of like time of possession. When one team is controlling the pace and the ball and the other team is just like, give it back. Like, what? Let us get an opportunity here. Let like we can't climb back into this unless we have the ball, or we're just cooking and we're just hitting quick and actually converting. So if they're not converting, if your defense is good enough and you're limiting them to a single possession, and the other direction you're getting those multiple opportunities and second chance points, you will knock them back on their heels. You do that over the course of you know a full quarter, a full game, multiple games in like the the homestand or whatever. I know you're going to open on the road, but if you're able to do that you will dictate the pace and the flow of the game. Now, a team, again, with a barrage, they get cooking. They can climb back in real fast, and it doesn't matter how you see. So it, with the game structured the way it is today, with the spacing, with the rules being as they are to favor the offense over the defense, you will have those moments where good offense will be good defense. Good defense, better offense. You hear that all the time. We'll see that. You will have those stretches, especially when you have a team that has the kind of players that the Clippers do guys that even if some of them, several of them are kind of past their primes are still relevant. You still have James Harden, Russell Westbrook. I know it's Russell Westbrook and shooting percentage doesn't really go together a whole lot, but um, Harden Westbrook, Paul George, uh, obviously Kawhi, your Terminator who has absolutely murdered you the two times you met up previously, but even still, it will make a huge, huge difference um, to the overall just feel and mo sense of momentum of the game. If you're controlling the boards and just making their life miserable, especially if you add physicality to it, because like it, you, you've seen even in this, like ahead of this matchup, Clipper fans are sharing the the photo after Kawhi. I believe it was Kawhi dunked on Maxi in transition. And you got Paul George. I think it was DeMarcus Cousins and um, and Paul George all screaming over Maxi as he's like on the ground and all that. 
the part no one ever talks about is that the Clippers lost that game. It, it doesn't matter because they still won the series. But like they're like, oh, time to dust off this iconic photo. And it's like, yeah, they they came out in that moment. They were the physical team. They were the team basically beating their chest. And it was like, okay, does Dallas have the guys to answer back and to you know show that same sense of physicality? I'm not saying you go out there and you lay a cheap shot on them, like send in your Markeith Morris, like they had Marcus Morris bludgeon Luca, and that was the 2020 series um, over the head. But you still get physical with them. You got your enforcers. You got your guys who are going to make life difficult for them who if they're coming in the paint they're gonna have to earn it that's that's just a different thing you add rebounding with physicality and uh defense you're gonna be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with most anybody so that's my most important that was my exceedingly long answer to a fairly direct straightforward question from tgk but you know what it's tgk so i wanted to be very thoughtful with my answer uh, ba -ba -ba. Richard K says, limit the Clippers steals and blocks. He says steals for him. No, no, I like the outside the box answer. Uh, Rug says, real question is, do they have Kawhi to start or is his injury more serious? If they don't have him, I think the Mavericks um, and five, I think is what he's saying. I'm not, I'm, I don't know the, the Kawhi situation. Honestly, I lean towards he's, he's going to be good to go. Does that mean that he's Kawhi of 2020 or 2021? Mm, probably not because that dude was an absolute, um, again, Terminator was a very apropos nickname for him. But Kawhi's only played in six playoff games since the Clippers last faced the Mavericks. So again, 2021, I think he faced, I don't remember who had this. I saw it on Twitter a day or so ago. He faced, who would it be? Phoenix. And was it still Utah before they had to blow up that roster? I think so. Before Dallas basically ushered in the, the blowing up of that jazz roster. I think Kawhi faced the Suns and the jazz, but he hasn't played much. So health has been an issue for him. I will be curious, therefore, to see where he's at. And again, with the with the kind of help they have in guys who even if they're past their primes, guys who can still at least do enough of the lifting, that that's going to be an interesting kind of conversation because he doesn't have to carry his team the way that he had to before. Paul George was better the second go around in the series with us. In 2020, Paul George was a uh, playoff P in addition to being the worst uh, nickname ever. Uh, played like garbage in 2020. In 2021, he was at least solid. Um, so you still got him. Now you got Russ and Harden and, you know, they got some other guys on their team that I like as well. So we'll see. I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of Kawhi we get. I've honestly not commented on that largely because I just operate under the assumption that it's going to be what we've seen in the past. Even if it's not, I just prep for the worst. I'm like, I'm prepping as if we got to go against Terminator Kawhi Leonard because sometimes that bell rings and you just don't know. Even if a guy's not 100%, he's going to roll out there and play like he's 100%. That's Luca in the 2020 series. Um, you know, he sprains his ankle, doesn't even know if he's going to play the next game, and he comes out and drops like 46 or whatever it was. Sometimes it just happens. Sometimes a guy just bell rings, and he's like, I don't even care what my health is. I'm going to go. Now, over the course of an entire series, is that doable? Mm, generally, no. But... For a single game, and it could be a pivotal game. Is it doable? Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. TGK says, greed rebounds is his as well, which impacts second chance points. Think if we negate that as much as possible, we'll win. Yeah. Uh, if you did Finn for 23 seconds and missed the rebound, that is a devastating feeling. Yeah, he's talking about conversely, like if you defend well, but you can't get the rebounds. Yes, yeah, so rebounding, huge. That's why I list as much as the improved defense is a huge, you know, new factor, new element in this whole conversation. It, it's still staggeringly different than rebounding. I think rebounding is the most pivotal thing because I think it's really the part that has been the most in Dallas's favor post deadline.
I'm just looking over some of my notes here. All right, let me jump back into the comments. Grayson Allen just signed. Okay, yeah, pivoting slightly out of the picture of the series here. Grayson Allen just signed a four-year, $70 million deal. Mavs fans um, were interested. So, yeah, um, Grayson Allen, I'm kind of wondering how Phoenix is making that work with their, their salary situation, how they had money to give him four for 70. That's kind of interesting. And aside from being like one of the dirtiest damn players in the league, uh, Grayson Allen's three point percentage and all that. He's one of those guys that if he's on your team, generally you, you like him. If he's not on your team, you hate him with a passion. I'm relatively ambivalent about him just because like we haven't had enough past crossing with him. He's never knock on wood caused any kind of devastating injury or anything to any of our guys, but the dude plays dirty and uh it's just generally unlikable so we'll see how that po how that works out um it's gonna be an interesting off season for the mavericks because like i know one thing's for sure you want a new deal for exum i would like to hang on to Derek jones jr but i also know that you're a you're probably not gonna b you've got depth coming up that you think could provide a similar impact as jones jr exum i think is the one who in the immediate picture is a little harder to replace and i think because he was more so hanging on for dear life with this comeback effort um in the nba i think it's i think he's put down more roots here whereas derrick jones jr i think because of his role in being what it is i think he'll have opportunity elsewhere if he chooses to go elsewhere at, at a bigger money deal than dallas probably wants to offer for what his role is Um, let's see. Hmm. <laughs> A lot of good discourse here in the comments. Appreciate you guys. Uh, let's see. If you got a question specific for me, either at DDP or at the Dallas Prospect, so it highlights it for me and I can more easily see it because we got a lot of good conversation here, but I'm trying to like sift through it to make sure I'm not missing anybody's direct questions. Frank asking if we're talking about the offseason. No, I mean, we've I've been running for an hour at this point. So we, we've talked about the series largely, but we've also talked a little bit um, about the general picture around it and everything. We talked a little bit about the MVP. Shout out TGK. I see you sharing uh, the post on Twitter. Appreciate that. The stream. Here's the thing that's interesting to me, too, is with the Mavericks starting this series on Sunday, that means you're getting, what, like 10 days of rest for Luka and Kyrie? Dude, that's huge. Getting that kind of rest before you got to start a playoff series, that that is awesome because that was one of my few real concerns uh, with the season winding down. I'm glad it worked out where we got to basically just rest our guys those last two games. But even still, I was a little bit concerned about the the mileage and the the grind on your two main guys. And, you know, we saw Luca bleeding knees, limping around a lot at times. And you knew he was kind of gutting it out down the stretch. Him getting this kind of rest and Kyrie, who is what played, he played 35 straight games. I think it was before resting those last two. That's huge. Being able to get that kind of rest and not having to, not having to like gut it out and go out there. Cause even though those two, the again, we'll just go back to the context of 2020 and 2021. Those two teams being in that position, a six-game series and a seven-game series, the fact they were even in those series at all was a miracle. But you could tell even in those series, Luka was just spent. And the only reason it worked better in our favor in 2022 was because he got roughed up a little bit. I think it was, if memory serves, an ankle sprain, like a high ankle sprain. And he missed a couple games to open that season or that playoff series against the Jazz. 
But fortunately, that was the Jalen Brunson coming out party. And Dallas stealing those two games, you get Luka back into the mix, and it's just like, all right, here we go. Like, we're running. I think that I think that just, like, injected new life into the team because they didn't go screaming into the postseason that year. They were kind of finding a rhythm, but also kind of, like, not in a great spot. Luka's ankle sprain against the Spurs in that final regular season game, I think it was, happened, like, very late uh, in the game, like, when the game was basically decided. Um, I think it was the last game of the regular season. At least that's how I remember it. So all those things put you in a rough spot. And the Brunson thing just ignited new life in Dallas that they rode that wave as long as they did. And then by the time Luca came back, it was like, all right, we're on all cylinders. As far as this team, as far as the ceiling, this team can play to, they were, they were playing at it. And that was awesome. So very, uh, very cool stuff there. CVM, you flatter me. Appreciate you. <clears throat> Somebody said once I was, um, I think they said Ryan Reynolds or something, but they said like Costco Ryan Reynolds. I'm like, sir, first of all, thank you. I would have settled for wish.com Ryan Reynolds, but I will take your compliment and uh, hold it with me forever. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's just a different picture that that we have here in this situation. Luca getting that kind of rest We've never been able to give him this kind of rest going into a playoff series. So that alone has me fascinated, um, especially by the end of that Miami game. Man, I don't know how many of his last shots he missed. I want to say he missed like nine of his last 10 shots. And he, you could tell he was trying to set his feet even on his step backs. He was setting his feet. He was holding his form the whole way through, but he was just missing ugly by the end. And it looked like he was just gassed. Fortunately, it didn't affect the outcome of that game. But... I definitely was thinking even then, like, mm, he would do well with about a week's worth of rest. So being able to get him 10 days, love it. Absolutely love it. Um... Master Flame thinks Derek Jones Jr. will resign. I would love it if he did. I would love it. As long as we get a, a good team-friendly contract, I'm all for it because I... When I thought he hurt his shoulder um, in that game against, it was Miami, right? Yeah, I think it was that game against Miami. When I thought he hurt his shoulder, I was very concerned about that. I was like, oh, no, no, no. Remind me if I'm wrong, because now I'm wondering if it was Miami or if I'm thinking of a different game. Uh, oh, no, you know what? I think it was the Hornets game. I think it was the Hornets game, but I digress. Uh, when I thought he hurt his shoulder, I was like, oh, no, that is that is that's not good. Like this dude has been so good in what he brings to this team. And again, having him on the contract you've had him on is just tremendous value this season. Talk as much as we want about the trade deadline. Nico deserves all the love regardless, because the value he found in vet minimum contracts of Dante Exum, like this huge reclamation project. And not that we had to like rebuild him. He rebuilt himself, give him credit for his own reinvention overseas. But Dante Exum and Derek Jones Jr., getting those guys and at the contracts you got them, both of them are worth so much more than they're getting paid and have been just huge to this season. As much as we talk about the trade deadline and that infusion of new talent changing the attitude and the trajectory of this season, which they did, a big underrated part of it as well was just getting Dante back in the mix. Like, Dante is so big to this team. Um, I think, and, and so I, I would absolutely love to keep him around. I think I really want to keep both those guys, but if I can only keep one, I think I probably lean towards Dante. Oh, that's right. It was bam. You're right. Masta. I couldn't remember for a second. I was like, I was like, I remember the play, but those two games were back to back, uh, to close out that stretch. And so like my mind was kind of like, was it that night or was it the night after you're right? It was bam though. Uh, would you trade our young developing guys for experienced players? Um, let me throw the question up there. Throw some of these up here just as I'm answering them. Would I trade our young developing players for experienced guys? Um, I'm, I'm reluctant, but at the same time, if I know I got a one or two year window, obviously you're not in position to do anything right now. Let's see how this playoff run goes. 
if if this run goes poorly for some reason, knock on wood, then I probably do get more aggressive in the off season and say like, look, the Luca Kai window is one, maybe two more years. If we're going to do it with this tandem, it's got to be now. And so, and this is a very polar opposite position where I'm at today than where I was this, you know, the start of the year. I honestly consider Jaden Hardy one of the the highest value assets I'm willing to move from depending on what we're getting back, right? Like if you're if you're not trading them just to trade them, but if you're bringing them in a deal where you're like, okay, this is this is going and getting a quality guy that's more established than that you know of cuz honestly my my hesitation about Hardy kind of becomes like is he going to get the opportunity to be here or are you like for his rookie contract, especially like for the duration of his rookie contract, are you going to get a chance to get that value out of him? Or are we going to be in a situation where we're on to, you know, a second contract for him and Hardaway's finally gone or whatever for him to finally get those kind of minutes. I see the value. I think he should be playing more. And I think he could be an X factor in a playoff series even. But I just haven't seen consistent minutes, especially in the second half of the season. That, that's one of those things that as much as I love how this team has turned things around post deadline, I'm still a little bit miffed that we're not getting more consistent, hardy opportunity. It, like, I guess showcase is that it, it's been up and down at times, but hardy is one of those pieces that I probably consider. Probably consider um, looking at. Did I get new stuff? My screen looks really good. And the sound is great. Um, it's the same setup I've had. I might have slightly adjusted the focus of my camera better. And I got a, a backlight over here that's just giving me a little bit of fill light that's helping. So trying to do a little bit more with my setup. Um, not to put the cart before the horse, but if it works out, I've got a rather incredible situation. Um, that could make my setup much better very, very soon. But I don't want to put the cart before the horse and just say it's happening because it's not signed, sealed, delivered yet. But uh, I am working on something that if you like this, you're going to love what comes next. Unless it doesn't happen, in which case, forget I ever even hinted at it. Appreciate you, Richard. Um, so yeah, as far as trading some of our young talent, you have talent that you could. I would not trade lively. I'm not yet ready, even though he's had a lot of injuries this year. I would not yet say that he's injury prone and therefore not worth hanging on to. I think especially if now he is your backup, I don't think you worry about that at all. But if you can get yourself a guy like that, like Frank points out, <laughs> Michael Bridges uh, for Josh and Hardy. Um, Michael Bridges, man, he's played like, oh man, I think it was Landon that had the stat the number of consecutive games he's played, he's played every game of his NBA career. And he also played like all three seasons. He was at, I think it was Villanova. Uh, dude doesn't miss. And for what he brings to the table. Yeah. Yeah. A deal like that would be very tantalizing to me. So maybe in that scenario, um, I, I look, Josh green's not looking like he's becoming what I hoped he would. I thought he was going to be a little bit more, but I still like what he brings to the table. I just think that you, can find that in a different form, especially now that he paid him. I think you can find that type of thing in another form. And so you don't necessarily have to be hitched to that particular wagon. Uh, Frank's talking about Grayson Suns having his bird rights. Yeah. TGK says he thinks you can get mid-level exception for Derek Jones Jr. Again, if you can love it, but I, I just have a gut feeling that somebody's going to offer better than that. And that his stop in Dallas was, let me reclaim my value here playing with Luca and playing with Kyrie. And so I think his value has been reclaimed. And I think he's going to be, I, I think he's going to have more opportunities than the mid-level. That's, that's my thinking. Not that Dallas wouldn't want him, but that what he can get is going to be better. And unless Dallas is like right there on the cusp, like in the finals, he's not going to look at it and say like, Ooh, I feel like I need to run it back. Um... T 
PGK with a hypothetical here. If LeBron wants to win a title or two, wouldn't taking a mid-level exception with the Mavericks this offseason be best? He could be the stopgap small forward for handling or for handing the reins to Omax. Man, you want to talk about a these kind of hypotheticals, I'm always so torn on because I'm like, I I honestly to an extent hate hypotheticals because like the only hypotheticals we talk about are the fun ones, right? Like we don't talk about the like hypothetically speaking, what would happen if uh both Exum and Derek Jones Jr. left and then there was a drop off next year with this or health issues with this kind of like we saw after the 2020 run playoff run where the next year coming back, then Lucas got his issues. He comes in a little bit overweight. You know, you got all these things that make it a step back here. Like no one wants to talk about those hypotheticals, understandably. So, but like when every other hypothetical that is discussed is kind of like a, would this not be amazing now from LeBron's perspective? Yes. For a guy that's been obsessed with playing with Kyrie for a guy that has been, even though he is the main orchestrator behind so many of the Lakers moves they've made since he got there, you look at all that and you say like, okay, um, if he is done with LA in this chapter, unless he's like looking to go back to Cleveland or something like that would finally playing with Kyrie in Dallas and playing with Luca, who he has expressed wanting to play with make sense and still give him that opportunity to go win a title. Yes. I can also not express enough how surreal and, bizarre it would be seeing lebron in a mavericks jersey it's just one of those things that my brain never allowed to process though to be fair there was a time i said that about Kyrie as well even until they landed the Kyrie trade uh even when it was just like a hey why not look at this why not try to go get Kyrie? i was still like ah oh, man i can't see that there's no way there's no way that they could do that and like especially the noise then you're just like ah, i i don't know i have a hard time seeing that but they did it and it's worked out and it's like ah oh, oh okay i was wrong so is it possible? Yes. Would it make sense uh, for LeBron for trying just for that last little push for a year or two, especially because LeBron's at four. So if he had that run of a year or two, like again, going to the full extent of your hypothetical to win a title or two, if he's really chasing Jordan and it's like, Hey man, if I match him in titles and yeah, I, I know what my record in the finals is, but if I match him in titles and I got like 12 finals appearances, yeah, any any discussion kind of goes out the window because at this point, unless the Lakers just do something insane and then he backs up into your hypothetical of the Mavericks, he's not passing Jordan. Um, again, going to the fullest extent of your hypothetical, um, we, we don't know how long it goes beyond there. I have a hard time seeing LeBron, especially at the rate and usage and everything else and just the, the shape of his feet, honestly, seeing him going beyond three more years um, playing. So uh, it, it would be fascinating. Is there logic to it? Yes. Do I see it? It's hard for me to see, but to be honest, I didn't, I wasn't the visionary that had the the foresight for the Kyrie thing to happen. It did. I'm glad that it did, but I didn't see it happening. Mostly because I just, I'm a little jaded. <laughs> I just feel like ever since we blew up, willingly blew up our own championship team, I'm just like, we don't deserve good things. We don't deserve good things. We already got Luca. The universe won't give us another one. It won't allow it to happen. Uh, so maybe I'm not the right guy to ask about that. But there is a logic to what you say. Yes. Rugs, DDP, most likely worst case scenario for this series. Man, you're just tapping into my, my uh, pessimistic roots, aren't you? most likely worst case scenario um health man health it's always health luca sprains an ankle or something i'm knocking on wood as i say all of this so don't you put that bad juju on me i'm not doing anything here health uh a turned ankle for luca or Kyrie. um a Derek lively injury or worse a gafford injury um, you know, health is always the biggest one to me because like you can have misfortune happen in a game. You can be up in prime position to close out a key game and have it bite you in the ass. Uh, we saw that in the 2022 Western conference finals with the warriors when Dallas had a chance to get game three and were in position to do it. And they collapsed at the finish line or was that game two? I forget. Might've been game two. Um, the whole series would have felt different if Dallas doesn't collapse there. It felt like, okay, that's not the last hurrah that we got. Like, we're not going to be in a situation. They didn't get swept, obviously, but they got gentlemen sweeped. 
But if they get that and the series is one, one or even two, one, it would have felt different than instead looking at it and being like, who? Oh, three. Nobody's come back from Oh three. We are on fumes and they are out coaching us. They are out playing us. We're, we're in a really bad spot. That's where they were. You can have that happen, but in a lot of cases, have it be just one or maybe even two games. If health becomes the problem, that is much harder to deal with because at some point when health is the problem, there are no chess moves to be made. Like you are at, you, you're at the end. There's no adjustments to be made. Jason Kidd said during the season at one point when asked about Luca and the game plan, he said he is the game plan. Other than Jason Kidd trying to be cutesy with what he was saying, essentially trying to think he was, I don't know, doing some mic drop thing where fans are going to be like, oh, yeah, man. Yeah, no, I totally think you're a great coach now. Uh, aside from that, you looked at it and you said like, well, yeah, it's true, though. If you don't have Luca, your picture changes drastically. Now, because you still got Kyrie, you still got a puncher's chance. And by the way, that cuts both ways. But if you don't have, if you, if you're missing too much, whether it's one or both, or one of them's limited because of his own issues, then at some point it's just like, man, you just got to go out there and you just got to give it everything you got. We can try to game plan and strategize, but at some point you're up against it and either you're going to somehow rise to the occasion or you're going to get trampled. Decide what you will, you know? So health is always to me a worst case scenario if you have to talk about like, how could this go wrong? But I don't like to talk about that. Remember my podcast is positively relentless. That is my mindset and mantra. I don't just apply that here. I apply that to all walks of life. So ask me, ask me more positive stuff. Come on. I'm just kidding. Ask whatever you want to ask. Um, who would you like us to trade for? Asked Joe uh, to play the three next year. Who would I like us to trade for? Honestly, I got to look at that in the off season. Um, I try not to put, and I used this expression earlier, so I'm going to sound like I'm just, harping away on it again, but I don't like to put the cart before the horse. I'm not even thinking about the off season right now. I don't, and that's the front office's job. Me, I'm entirely focused on what the current picture is. I have like, there are guys out there that I'm like, this kind of player would fascinate me. Let me double check and make sure he's available. Like I seem to think he's available this off season, or let me try to guess like, what would we have to give up if we were to go try and get him? That that's a different conversation. Um, so that that's a follow-up video for me to do, but I, I agree uh, the three position would be a very nice position of need to fill at this point. Do, 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 do. Mm -mm. This is my first time coming. Oh, I already read this earlier. I'm starting to throw on the board because it's one of the nicest compliments I've gotten. So again, thank you, CVM. As long as this screenshot can be here, <laughs> then I'm going to act like I'm deserving of this uh, extremely nice compliment, even though I just made that face. So we're, we're going to live with that for a minute. By the way, shout out and great love and appreciation to all you beautiful people on a Monday morning. 36 of you in the house right now. Much appreciated. This is uh this has been fun. I've enjoyed this conversation. Now we're just now we're just mixing it up. We're just chopping it up a little bit here. Keep hitting me with those questions. I got nothing I'm doing right now. <laughs> I didn't catch the context of the conversation, but somehow this one uh somehow this one just brought a smile to my face. The initiation for new members in 2024 involves a goat and a chicken. Are those new members to the prospect crew or are those new members to, uh, <laughs> to the Mavs fandom? I don't know. Either way, either way, there's, there's something there. And I feel like there's a lore I'm not cued in on.
Uh, let's see. Do you think the Mavs will attack Kawhi more often knowing he's not 100%? I think he would be foolish not to. The same way other teams attack Luka relentlessly, trying to wear him out on defense. One, expose him on defense, which is now thankfully harder to do, but trying to expose him on defense and then trying to wear him out so that on the other end he can't go thermonuclear, I, I think is huge. That's everything, right? Um, I'll tell you one guy that's having PTSD right now, uh, Zubats. No way that dude wants to see Luca. Luca headhunts him mercilessly. And the thing is, the guy doesn't even play. It's not even like he defends possessions poorly against Luca. Luca just absolutely cooks and destroys him. It's it's quite remarkable. I enjoy watching it. But um, yeah, you'd be foolish not to attack Kawhi, knowing he's not 100% now. And here's the thing too, right? Like, Again, I don't like using football analogies because I understand the the audiences don't cross over enough, especially with so many uh, European or originating subscribers and followers to the platform and obviously the sport. But with like football, when you run a run, when you run the running back a lot, even early on in the game, first quarter, and it's like dirty yards, it's like the train wreck collision and you're getting like a yard, maybe two. And it's like, man, you're running the ball a lot early on. What are you doing? It's like it's a war of attrition. Just because Kawhi comes out there and he's defending things well, giving you some problems, perhaps even defending you in the first quarter as you're trying to attack him, attack him, attack him, doesn't mean that that knee is going to hold up over the course of four quarters, let alone over the course of eight quarters or 12 quarters or 16 quarters or so on and so forth. Like you keep attacking, that knee will have to try to compensate for it. And at some point, it might wear out and he might get a step slower. He might not be able to do as much on the other end because you're limiting him. So yeah, you've got to do it. It's just a matter of, it's just a matter of, you know, who who's going to do and how, how that's what I want to see. Obviously it's going to be Luca. It's going to be Kai because they're going to switch things up. I'm sure, but uh, be very curious to see how Dallas tries to go at him. I don't know if this was crosstalk or towards me. Paid me a compliment. The, the team rebuild, profit from the torn line. Uh, if it's crosstalk, no worries. If it's directed to me, paid me a compliment. Cool. Appreciate you, bro. I think it was crosstalk because now I see this one and now I feel like a tool for trying to steal a compliment that wasn't directed to me. Uh, yeah, so Master Flame, I think they absolutely have to attack him. Uh, DDP, did you get, oh, and I already read this question earlier. Rogue says, DDP, I honestly think we have the better pieces to trade. Oop. I think you let Hardy get as many years on the books as Josh. Look, I would love to let spam call, ignore it. I would love to let, <laughs> as if it wasn't spam, I would take the call right now. No. Uh, I would love to, to hang on to Hardy because again, I think he's got more ability. I think used properly. He could have been in your six man of the year conversation this year. That was, that was probably my boldest prediction coming into the year was I thought he would, if not win it, at least be in the conversation and just never had the opportunity to even start to sniff that. Like even when things were really bad, he wasn't getting the opportunities. And that's what for me was so strange. So having said that, I would love to hang on to Hardy. My only question is, is he going to get the real opportunity here with kid? Because the reason Josh got, has gotten the, the time and patience and opportunity to grow is one. He's very good at corner threes. That is his bread and butter. And that is something that our offense creates a lot of Two, A lot of stuff he brings to the table is very intangible. It's, it's not just the athleticism, the sugar glider stuff. It's also the explosiveness, the hustle, the at times instinct for, you know, where to go with the ball and how he give, makes just these effort plays that not a lot of guys, even at this level, are matching. That and the promise of him being a legit bona fide three and D option, I think, has given him this time. Hardy is a little bit different. Like he's a little more one dimensional. He's not a defender. 
I think his, his scoring ability absolutely exceeds anything Josh can do. I think he also can be a good playmaker. And by the way, that's another thing that um, that's another thing as well that Hardy does well and that Josh does well, that playmaking ability. But I do think Hardy has the ability to at least match, if not exceed that. So I love the idea of giving Hardy that opportunity, but because he's more and more one dimensional, unless you're going to pencil him in to be that perennial spark plug off the bench, it's a little bit harder to carve out like his fit as you think more rotationally, I think than what they have believed and assumed that Josh green is and can continue to become more of. Josh Green is still only 23. That feels insane, but yeah. Michael Bridges is Derek Jones Jr. with a shot. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and by the way, I, I've said this before, but salute to uh, Derek Jones Jr. adding the three-point shot that he's added to this extent uh, the last couple of years. Cause really that, that was a reclamation project. The dude was not a good shooter until the last couple of years. So him getting to this point and being at least reasonable is, is very nice. Salute. Ed, Ed, how do I, would I pronounce the V like a V or do I got to change that? Is it Edward? Edward. Or is it Edward? I'm not trying to be mocking in the slightest. I'm genuinely curious, but salute, uh, salute to you, sir. In Slovenia. Uh, let's see. DDP, you missed it. The bird's right thing was Grayson Allen when he signed a four-year contract. How can the Suns pay these guys? How can they pay these guys? Um, I thought the bird's right thing was how we explained they did. Again, I haven't looked closely at the Grayson Allen thing. I'm just kind of amazed with how much they've done in the last couple of years, how much they've spent, how much they've tried to do, that that's where they're sitting. So I, I can't really add a whole lot to that conversation. Luxury tax, yeah, that's a fair bet. TGK has too many hobbies to do shows on demand. Yeah, there, there's, dude's got a lot going on. Uh, very much appreciate and respect TG's grind. Let's see here. We're all blaming King for any bad juju because he was the first one to bring up anything about injuries. Okay, good. As long as it's not me. Not that I want to put anything, uh, not that I want to put anything on uh king but um as long as i'm not the one that's being directed at we're good um if i were the clippers i'd be watching tape on how golden state guards luca going back to the west finals uh and all the way to that last game they kill screen actions the thing is like, yeah, you can, you can refer back to that, but it's a little bit of a, um, part of what, part of what they did for, for a team that has the ultimate head case instigator in Draymond green, they really went out of their way not to poke the bear with Luca. You notice that like every other team in the playoffs that year was trying to punk Luca trash talking, not just Devin Booker, even against the jazz, their fans, everybody was like, going at him, trying to get under his skin, trying to get in his head. The Clippers did that in their first two matchups with him as well. And it does not go well for you. The Warriors seem to be the first team that kind of understood like, hey, let's not poke the bear. And so like Luca would get knocked down on a play. Draymond Green, of all people, is like helping up like, oh, yeah, good job, man. Good job. Great, great drive. Great drive. You know, even if even if he's fouling him, he's like helping him up. He's not taking dirty shots at him. He's like almost like, you good? All right, cool, man. Good. Great, great job, man. You're doing so good today, you know? And, man, if you lost weight, like, he's, like, really trying to pump him up, build him up a little bit, but he's not trying to, like, bring out that dog in Luca because he's like, yeah, no, man, the last thing we want to do is get Luca on the war path. If anything, we want to keep him kind of complacent and uh, a little more docile where 
as much as we can. Um, you know, we're not adding fuel to his fire. So that's one thing. Yeah. How they attack him with the screen action, I, the, the coaching and the roster composition of the warriors is a very uniquely situated thing. I don't know that the Clippers can match that, but that could be something that they try to do. The fact is because you've got more help now and because you've got guys like Kyrie, even if they're keeping Luca relatively bottled up compared to the first two go throughs, the first two matchups, they don't have a whole lot to counter. It's like, if you're selling out to, to wear Luca out, you're going to be a little more hard pressed to contain Kyrie. And if you're more hard pressed to contain Kyrie, you can get some role players going. And if another role player or two happens to step up, then holy crap, you are not going to also be able to keep Luca down. You can't keep everyone down. You can keep down one. You might be able to relatively contain two, but if you get three, you're in trouble because it's about to be a fire sale. It's about to be, everybody's going out of their mind. Everybody is just blitzing you from all sides. Besides Powell and George, is there anyone else that worries you about the Clippers? I might catch, I might catch some uh, heat for not heat, but um, there might be people that disagree with me. I still think Russell Westbrook off the bench is an X factor. I do. He's not a high percentage shooter. We know this. We know this. But I still think Russell Westbrook has a a certain tenacity and he's got so much passion and heart that he plays with that. I think if you get him firing guys up and he's making plays, whether it's creating for others or just getting some big rebounds again, if he's battling in there and he's snatching rebounds away from your front court, that's going to be a challenge. Now, obviously he's dropped off overall in the last couple of years, but I do think once they kind of moved him more to that role, it served well. Um, so I think he could be an X factor. And I know that during a game, was it earlier this year? Or was it last year? Um, Clipper fans with their warps perception of what Luca is, which is amazing considering the playoff matchups that we've had with him, the playoff history. But yeah, he, he's Luca's like quote unquote coming out party was Russ's MVP year. or Maybe it was the year after his MVP a preseason matchup with Real Madrid with Russell Westbrook and Luca playing against each other. Now Luca didn't play a lot of minutes in that game and it's not like Luca cooked them or anything like that, but there were people who wanted to put like that slander on Russ or whatever at the time saying like, Oh, this like 18 year old kid or whatever, or 17 year old kid, whatever he was at the time. <laughs> Honestly, it was probably younger. That might've been like 16, uh, like cooked Russ or gave Russ the business, whatever gave him the business. But it, it's still like he's done pretty decent against Luca. And so he could be an X factor. So as I look at that, I think if Russ is a difference maker, an impact player for them off the bench, that has potential to be troublesome. Because Russ is such a remarkable and tangible thing where it's like, sometimes he's really bad. And you're like, ooh. Glad he's on their team and not ours. And then there's times where it's like, oh, okay. I don't know that you're turning back the clock, but you're definitely having an impact on this game and, you know, putting us in a tough spot. I don't know Russ's exact age off the top of my head. I guess I can look it up. I guess I have the power of Google. Russell Westbrook is 35 years old. Yep, 35. So a lot of mileage, but you still got those kind of moments from him. And what are his actual actual stats here from the season? 11 points, five boards, four and a half assists, shooting 45%, only 27% from three. So you'll see a lot of drop coverage there. Uh, free throws, 68%. So again, ho-hum, but you're still talking about a guy who, you know, for his career, almost 22 points a game, seven boards, eight assists. Um, and it's just a guy that plays with such heart and passion and does have a little bit of a clutch gene to him as well. It's obviously dampened in recent years, but I'm not going to forget the time that he, on the one season he spent with the, the Wizards, helped with Beal lead that team into the playoffs because they was just like, no, there's no way. That's where 
he's, he's done. He's washed. That's a, it's over. And I think he catches some unfair slack too about like how things went with him with the Lakers. Him with the Clippers has been much better, much, much better. And so I think he does have a potential to be an X factor uh, for that. Maybe I should be more concerned about Harden. Maybe I'm just not up to date enough with how Harden's season has been. But I feel like Russell is a bigger intangible to try and game plan for and more challenging in that respect. Because so much of it is the passion with him. And that comes out in defense, that comes out in hustle plays, that comes out in just things that are hard to quantify um, in, in the same way. Predating, following DDP for a long time, predating 2024. Gotcha. All right, all right, fair enough. Uh, with the full season next year and how PJ has played defensively this year, you think PJ can improve to the point of all NBA level defense? Do I think he could be an all NBA defensive player for the Mavericks? That's challenging. Like, could he be in the conversation? I, th I think so. I do. Um, do I think he could achieve that? I don't know, because sometimes even the defensive awards don't make sense. Sometimes even in those, it's almost like a name brand versus that. Like you can have two guys resume side by side. One is very clearly the better defender, but the other guy gets the conversation and the reputation. And so we talk about them like there's something more. Patrick Beverly is one of those guys. Patrick Beverly is not a great defender. He's an irritant. He's a gnat, uh, a pesky defender. And it's like because he has this artificially built reputation, he's allowed to play more physical than most players in the league you know previously before that you had guys like lance stevenson with that resume draymond green to an extent has that resume um you know in the past meta world peace you had guys like that who kind of had the the name recognition to them that allowed them to do that and so like if you would see those type of names in a conversation with a guy that might be actually be a better defender the better defender guy might not get it because he doesn't have the name brand thing it, it that's just the challenge there. So could I see him in the conversation? Maybe again, if he plays defensively around the level of this, but I still think that even though it's a defensive war award, I think unless he is shutting guys down, like, like we've seen his limited attempts, limited exposure against like Wimby and the impact he's had there. If he can build that kind of portfolio against several key players, several big name, big, again, brand players, then he can have that conversation. Then he can have, um, you know, that argument here, but we'll see. Also media just doesn't like the Mavericks. <laughs> so who knows? He might have an uphill battle just for that. You hear the media talk. I'd be surprised if, if all-star voting was purely a media thing and not fans, the way they talk about Luca, I could see them making arguments against Luca being an all-star. Even sometimes they're so ridiculous. What are your thoughts on the difference between PJ and Grant's contribution to the Mavericks? Uh, Grant, he's talking about Grant Williams. Grant Williams, I'm not, I know there was slander for him when he left, not just Maverick fans, but other NBA fans as well. I think with him, I think he's a character, but at the same time, if things are going well, that character is well received when they're not going well, it is probably incredibly grating. And the problem is he was the character when he had only been here for a little while and things were going very poorly because of overall team health that combined with after like the first 10, 15 games, his three point shot, just completely abandoning him. And then suddenly him looking completely out of place and all of that as he did, I think it just kind of put him in a weird, difficult spot. And he doesn't have the size or athleticism to do that. Like they hoped he would be kind of what PJ has been able to be for them, even though PJ's offensive game hasn't been consistent at all with Dallas thus far. I think they kind of had hopes that he could do something like that. And it just didn't work out. And yeah, like uh, Edward said, he was kind of a tweener. So when it wasn't clicking, 
that mixed with the personality thing, it just, it graded, it, it wore guys out and they got frustrated with it. But when it did key in and when things did start to turn the corner, I think it drastically changed um, that. And, you know, when I talk about ch- turning the corner, I'm talking about like once Dallas got in a guy that I was actually able to perform at that level, what they thought they were getting with Grant, they did get largely with PJ. And you saw how much different the team looked again, longer, more athleticism, more versatile defender and a guy that is less grading of a personality. Certainly when things are good, Grant's personality works great when they're not good. It's annoying. And that's why you had like the report of like in practice, him talking trash to Luca or whatever, basically telling like calling him out for not trying or whatever. And Luca's like, Oh, okay. And then Luca single-handedly going for like 15 possessions in a row, just bucket, 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 bucket. Um, and going at Grant as much as possible. Like, you know, like, who are you talking trash? One of the best uh, stories from, I'm trying to remember who it was. It wasn't, it's one of those guys that he was here very briefly and he was married to a Kardashian, but I've blanked on his name. And he was married to Kim, in fact. Um, I don't remember who, it was because his own NBA career was such a blink and you miss it. Who cares sort of thing. But he had a stint with the Mavericks and he tells this story about like in practice, like shooting around, shooting with Dirk and Dirk kind of like being a little goofy, like in a scrimmage or something like a little bit more relaxed at the time. And a possession after Dirk did something like that. Uh, he did, he did something sort of similar and Carlisle immediately stops the scrimmage And just chews his ass out over it. And he's like, well, Dirk did it. And he's like, yeah, Dirk, all-time great at the time, maybe like number eight uh, all-time scorer and NBA champion and all this. Yeah, he can do whatever he wants. You, you don't screw around at all, (laughs) at all here. You take this seriously, basically. It's kind of like, do you have the skins on the wall or not? And so like, for Grant calling out Luca. It's like, I know that Luca doesn't have a title. I know that Grant has at least been in the finals. I get that. Having said that, it's also true that it's also true that like, which of these guys has more, more skins on the wall, which of them has more, uh, that they can tout and that they can like point to for like, Oh, who who of us is that guy? So yeah, it it didn't go over well, according to that report. And again, that was after the trade. So we're, we're off in the wilderness here on this topic a little bit, but I think the difference is just the length, the athleticism, honestly, the, just the, just being the right culture fit, I guess. And even when PJ is not scoring well, which has been a good chunk of his tenure thus far, he's still hustle. He's still defending. He's still rebounding. He's been integral to this post post trade deadline turnaround. And that I just can't say that about Grant. When the offense left Grant, he became a liability. And it was just like, this whole experiment's not working, huh? And like not working to such an extent. We had you on just a couple of year deal, like a two or three year deal. And we're getting rid of you at the first possible opportunity. We have already sold all of our stock in you that we had a decent amount of stock in to begin with. You were a sign and trade. We gave up stuff to get you and we're already out. So that to me says something. Virgin country forgot to put the DDP to get you to read his question. All right, let me roll back and see if I can find it. Virgin country. That's a, that's a username. How far back is it? Oh, (laughs) gotcha. Uh, I see, I see what username you're referring to now. Let me find whatever comment I think you're specifically referencing. Wait, is that the one I just read before I clicked on this one? I think it is. Moving on. Yeah, BJ. Yep, I just answered that. 
talking about him as a all defensive caliber guy and then talking about him versus Williams and that difference. Just want to put this here just because I want to give Omax some love. Yeah, no, we've we've been high on Omax since they drafted him. We've we've been I I was one of those guys that said that he was gonna need some time to develop. I know there were some people when they got him that were immediately talking about him sliding right into the Dorian Finney Smith role. And I was like, eh, not yet. Let's give him a year, maybe two. But I like what I see. Um, the jump shot in particular, how smooth that is. The again, the defensive ability, versatility, all that that I see. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Think he could be a very good impact player for this team uh, in the future. I, I think you can make some argument that he should be at least somewhere at the bottom of the rotation, even if it's only in a reserve role um, in the playoffs, just because his skill set would be particularly useful in a series like this. Richard Case. Yeah, no, don't trash talk Luca ever. Don't, I mean, like, if you're another team, you should be like dusting him off, shaking his hand, calling him, saying, yes, sir, no, sir, all of that. Cause you, you keep him from going thermonuclear warpath and you're good. Man, I almost feel like that's not even an expression I can use in the world today, uh, just with the state of, you know, current affairs. But yeah, you, you want to keep Luca not on the, path to destroy you and embarrass you will lively be ready sunday is there an injury update i've not seen an injury update but i my understanding is that he'll be available um maybe they'll be a little bit more capped with his minutes but my understanding of his injury at the time was that it was basically they were shutting him down for the rest of the regular season in part just to ensure that he would be good to go for the playoffs. I, I took it almost as a precautionary thing, but if somebody knows something different about that, by all means, let me know. That's my understanding. Kid said, we'll see about lively, ready to play in game one. See, there you go. Frank already answered. Ask. Where is it? There it is. Ask and you shall receive. Yeah, I... I I would expect he's ready in some capacity, whether or not they have to play him or play him much different conversation, but I think he's probably close. And I think they've been a little cautious, I guess. Everyone knows how I feel about certain players, but if we just get one good game from Maxi and Tim, we can be anyone. And I do believe that still want to trade them though. Okay. Fair enough. Um, yeah. If you get a, if you get a Timmy burner game, even if it's just a single game, Okay, you're going to be damn hard to beat in that one game. Uh, and Maxi, I mean, we saw that in a playoff game. Heck, a playoff series against the Jazz in 2022. That first series against the Jazz, he could barely miss from three. Now he came crashing back to earth, I think, after the first three or four games of the playoffs. But early on, he was cooking. Of course, everyone was cooking against the Jazz with those corner threes. I mean, Bertans looked like a very nice player for us for a minute. Luca was 16 back then. There's the clarification. Yeah, I said 18, and I was like, that's not right, because if it was after, right after Russ's MVP, that timeline doesn't match up. Yeah, 16. You're right. Uh, answered that on age. Cowboy X Factor was good. So he can be a spark from the bench for 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, that's, that's what I think. And yes, Harden's like the same exact age as Russ. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the best way to quantify Westbrook's impact. He's high motor, can absolutely be a spark. He can be an irritant on defense. He can get steals. He can have the diving for the loose ball. He can still rebound well, just not for like the full duration of a 48 minute thing like he used to do. And, uh, you know, he's still got a bit of a clutch shot thing. Like, I know he's not a good shooter, especially this stage in his career in terms of percentages, but like he still has. You know, and he puts it uh, as he's talked about, like Tim Hardaway Jr., like almost that, like that ignorant sort of mindset where it's like, nah, man, like I don't care. I don't care. Like I feel no fear in this shot. I see it. I want it. I take it. And sometimes that fearlessness just works in your favor. Like you take shots that everyone's like, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. There's also been plenty of times where that's not gone great for him. But 
when you got that and you got him, like, like, let me put it this way. He soars for a rebound, gets an offensive rebound. They kick it out. They get a three. He plays hard defense and makes it difficult on Luca driving to the basket, gets a strip uh, or gets a block, a chase down block. Then he gets one of those awkward pull up bank shot things. He's screaming. He's pumping his chest. His team is going to feed off that. Even if he only plays 15 minutes in that game, just that stretch of three or four plays can spark something. That's the kind of player he is. It might only result in like four, five, whatever points for him, but he's making his impact and his presence known. That's the spark. That is the bigger thing. And that's the sort of thing that about Russ can still worry me even at this stage because he still shows he can do that. He can still put together an off the bench triple double. It's just a lot more modest of numbers than it used to be. Russ is more of an X factor than Harden. Harden's going to choke like usual. He also doesn't have Russ's crazy motor and drive. Yeah, I agree. Harden, Harden's for, for a player that's considered like an all-time great, like Harden gets considered. And again, when I talk about that, I'm just talking about like the all NBA 75 team, a team that Kyrie was left off of. Um, that's the sort of thing that for some reason just never comes into the conversation about Harden because his, yes, his team has gotten to the West finals once, maybe twice. But Harden, historically, in the postseason, has never done much. Now, I do remember in 2012, when the Mavericks were the defending champs, Harden was just the thing they had no answer for against the Thunder. Like, they, the, the Thunder beat the Mavericks in five in that series. Or no, they, they swept them. Correction, they swept them that series. Um, and that was the... He wasn't, on, he wasn't playing in that series, but that was technically like the Lamar Odom era of the Mavericks. Um, keep your powder dry, but he, he was something the Mavericks just simply had no answer for. Having said that, the reason that Thunder team flamed out when they got to the finals and went up one Oh was because he didn't have a good series against the heat in the finals. Like Russ and KD were largely doing their thing, but they didn't have enough scoring outside of those three guys. And then when Harden dropped off. Uh, it, it was, that was it. Like the heat stole one in OKC. And then on the road, as I talked about earlier at that stage of his career, Harden was, he was the six man of the year, but he was still a role player. Role players play better at home than they do on the road. When the series turned to Miami, Harden's numbers all dipped. So that was kind of your, your difference there. That's why the series went five, never got back to OKC. The heat stealing game two in OKC basically decided that series because Harden reverted to the typical role player thing. So more so concerned about Russ than I am Harden. That's not to say that Harden can't still be a, a difference maker, but I don't think it provides the same spark and infectious, um, you know, infectious nature that Russ does. Can the Mavericks get some athletic power forward in the future? Like the Nuggets have an Aaron Gordon. Aaron Gordon, man, landing the Nuggets landing him was might have been Nick Angstad that said this. It, it was like a one of one. You just don't get that caliber of player. The fact that the rest of the league allowed that to happen. I don't mean the league literally. I mean that like no other team made a better offer for that. For the Nuggets to get him was so huge to their, you know, eventually winning a championship and being the team they've been now the last few years. It, it should not especially for what they gave up, like you should not have let that happen <laughs> to get another player like that is just not practical, not likely you kind of are just better off looking at it and saying like, all right, um, what's the best thing that we can get getting a player of that caliber. I don't think is even a conversation truly, but I think you can get yourself, um, a solid power forward again, PJ, he can, he can kind of fill that for you. He's like a three, four essentially for you. So he can give you a little bit of that, but I would be curious to revisit that in the off season and see like specifically what's out there in terms of free agents, what's out there in terms of plausible trades. That's an interesting conversation. I want to revisit by the way, guys, if you haven't already liked the video, subscribe to the Dallas prospect. We just hit uh let's see 5,220 subscribers salute to you. Why is Omax when he goes full breaks? Wait, 
Why does Omax, when he goes full breaks, he looks like he's wearing skates? <laughs> uh, some guys just have a little bit of slide and shiftiness to them, I guess. I don't know. I, I kind of get what you're talking about. Um, maybe a part of that's just body control. Some guys just have a different stride. I don't know. But a, a funny observation all the same. Looks like I'm caught up to the final question here. So we'll wrap this up uh, in just a second. I'll take, if you guys got them in quick order, I got three more questions I can answer after this one. But we've been going close to two hours, which I think makes this the longest prospect live stream in like three years. Been a while since I went this long. Cowboy X Factor asks, did you see the schedule? The Mavs will play game one Sunday instead of Saturday, which is most likely the evening one since it's in LA. I despise west coast i know it's not west coast time what it's called but i despise that uh that late of games especially for the playoffs if they're playing i'll be real with you man if the mavericks are playing a game on the west coast and i know that they're not tipping off until nearly nine o'clock unless it's a game of real importance if it's a regular season game a middle of the season regular season game or worse an early in the year regular season game, I'm probably not catching it live. I'm probably going to revisit, re read up on the game, skim through like the key plays of the recording and all that the next day. Um, and all of that. I hate when a playoff game is in that, in that late slot, because it's like, dude, I have a three, almost four year old. I'm so so tired by the time we get to like 10 30 and i'm like there's two full quarters left how how or it's you know a full quarter but it's gonna play like it's so long because if it's a close game we know how many times the clock is gonna stop how many commercial breaks we're gonna have in the final half of the fourth quarter god forbid it goes to overtime it's just like having to be committed to like going to midnight and then i start my day at like 4 30 5 o'clock so it's just like, it's just such an exhausting, exhausting thing to try and do um, regularly. So I hate it. As far as it being a Sunday game, it just means another day of rest, 10 days of rest for Luca and Kyrie. I do love that, but I hate the late night start time. So if it's Sunday night, who mercy, I'll, I'll have to gut it out, but it's playoff. So I'm there. I'm in it. Oops. Appreciate you, Richard. Uh, and Frank B, what is your streaming schedule going to be like during the playoffs? Uh, I think in this case, there's going to be a show. So the regular season, I'll, I'll even reduce it to this. When I've been back in my stretches here, I've been back largely as like, during the week, if it's a, a weeknight game, I'll, have, I'll be back the next day with that. Weekends are kind of crazier for me, again, with the young family and on the go running. I also teach like fitness classes and stuff on weekends that complicates things further. But playoffs are a different animal. So I plan to be live or at least posting a video after every single game of the playoffs. And if it's something where let's say like in this case, uh, let's hypothetically say that there's a game Friday night. Uh, and then the next game is like Monday because of the travel or something like that. There might be a scenario then where I also go live on a Sunday in addition to that, just to like preview the next game ahead of time, rather than be as much of a post game show talking about the previous game that just happened. So I, I haven't settled into an exact thing yet, but my expectation is there's going to be a game or there's going to be uh, at least a video, if not a stream for every game of this postseason run. I know that's been a challenge in the past. I always try to be available as much as I'm able to. Sometimes that's me in my own head and just kind of working through things. Other times that's just the impossibility of my schedule being what it is at that stretch. So I'm going to be here and available to you as much as I can be, because I enjoy like you guys are not being sappy. You guys are like, one of if not the highlight of my day sometimes getting on here talking with you guys mixing it up um i really appreciate it and i i appreciate everybody that's been with the channel for a long time it's helped us grow whether you got here today during this stream or whether you've been here since i started this thing in 2017 about 80 pounds heavier and with no beard if you remember those days 
Um, not that I have much of a beard right now. I'm not trying to grow the full creature back, but regardless of how long you've been here, I'm absolutely uh, appreciative of your support and uh, I will continue to be here as often as I can. I'm actually trying to set up again, not to put anything out there until I know for certain, but I have something that might be a whole new level of access and availability and a whole new le level of content that I've never been able to offer. I, I won't say anything more than that because again, now I'm going to be dreading it in the back of my mind. If it somehow falls through, uh, that uh, I'll be like, damn, I shouldn't have said anything at all, but I can't help it. Sometimes I want to share with you guys when I'm trying to do stuff. Cause I'm always trying to do stuff. I'm always trying to put something together for this to see if I can take this to another level. I think I might finally be on the cusp of that. And, uh, again, it's because of all your guys' support, keeping me motivated, keeping me humble when necessary and, uh, just our growth together. So, uh, let's see here. Did I already, I already got that one. Is this a new Mavs channel? I think I just found a gym. No, <laughs> I I've been here since 2017. Truly. Um, I, I was more active back in the day. I, I can attest to that the last couple of years, I've been a bit more spotty, but been pretty, pretty good here recently uh, on this stretch. Navigating other difficulties and challenges with life right now, but I'm trying to turn that into a positive. And if that positive means that I can be here more and putting out more content for you guys right now, then cool. Great. All here for it. I will make, I will take any situation handed to me and I will spin that shit into gold. I will find a way to turn it into a positive. I just look a little different. Just just a little different. Just a little different. Um, yeah. DDP, please explain that the like button is the thumbs down button. Explain that the like button is the thumb down uh is the thumbs up button. Okay, yeah, sure. I get what you're saying. I for some reason I read that backwards because uh apparently I have a little bit of a dix dix. I almost had dyslexia, but that's a whole different thing. Is that an example of dyslexia? If I can't say dyslexia, as I now struggle to say it. Um, yeah, uh, thumbs up. Thumbs up the video. Subscribe to the Dallas Prospect and all that good stuff. Season Steven Swaim, what's good, man? I do look just a little bit different. Just a little bit different these days. 82 pounds lighter. Healthiest I have been in my adult life. If you're curious about other stuff I got going on, I can talk about that another time. But I do have other projects as well that I'm working on. So there's Prospect. There's just my page, Derek W. Kirby. Um, and lots of good stuff coming out, though. So that's it for my time here today. We went over two hours. Thank you so much. Be on the lookout for more content this week. I will still be active even in the ramp up to this series. So because I've already hit all my taglines and all that, I'll just wrap it up with, and remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. Take it easy, guys.